13 in our Bibles briefly this evening, Acts 13. Remember to sign up for the ladies' meeting on November 4th, and remember that Friday is the Fall Fellowship. Remember to bring a dessert or food item to share with everybody, and we'll plan on having a great time together in the Lord this Friday evening beginning at 6 p.m. But uh, tonight we're going to go to Acts 13 and look at a few things from the Word of God. And I closed my thing here. So I've got to find it again. Acts 13, <clears throat> Mark's going to start reading in verse 12, Acts 12, I'm sorry, Acts 12, we'll start reading in chapter 12, verse 24, before chapter 13, Acts 12, verse 24, but the word of God grew and multiplied, and Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry. And took with them John, whose surname was Mark. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Menaean, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. When they had fasted and prayed, they laid their hands on them, and they sent them away. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia, and from thence... They sailed to Cyprus. Let us pray. Father, we thank you again for allowing us to be in your house this evening. I thank you for the request that you've granted us. We thank you for those who've been saved. We thank you for those who've been brought back to us uh, safely in their travels. We pray for those who will be traveling this week. We pray for uh, Sophia, and we pray that you'll give her uh, traveling mercies as she goes to India, and we pray you provide for her as she is there with the testing and different things that need to occur. We pray for Ginny. We thank you for how you brought her along, but we pray that you'll help her to be able to get an appointment this week for her knee. We pray for Lucette, who's going to have hernia surgery on Wednesday. We pray for those who have illness or pain in the body. We pray that you'd strengthen them tonight. We thank you for your word and how it gives us these things, provides these things for us, instructs us on how we ought to live for you. And we pray you'd help us to discern your will from your word tonight. We ask these things, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, the title of the message this evening is Ministering Unto the Lord. Ministering Unto the Lord. Because this is what it says there in verse 2. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And there's a lot of Christian people who say, Well, I feel called to do this, I feel called to do this, and I want to do that for the Lord. And maybe they ought to, maybe they ought not to try to do that thing for the Lord. But we have a desire to serve the Lord, and that's a good thing. That's a desire that we ought to have. We have some people who they, well, I feel like I want to be more connected and, and I want to be more of use in the church. I want to be active. That's a wonderful thing. And some Christians just need to know or want to know I'm doing right by my service in God's church. And all of those things are accomplished by this passage tonight. So I pray that if you are serving the Lord, if you are ministering to the Lord as Paul and Barnabas were, that you'll be encouraged to keep on doing that for the Lord tonight. And if you're lacking in your service for the Lord, I pray that you'll be stirred up to do more for the Lord. And if you're someone who is wondering if I should be doing this or that, I hope and pray that you'll get some direction from God tonight, or at least some direction on how to get some direction, which is where we'll look at tonight from this passage. Because Paul and Barnabas, Barnabas and Saul, in verse 25, were there, where the word of God was growing and multiplying, and they returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry and took with them John, whose surname was Mark. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers. And then he gives us list of people. But the first thing you need, if you want to be a minister unto the Lord, you want to be someone who's serving the Lord, is you need to be a member of God's church. You cannot correctly serve God without being a member of his church. You realize that? Unless you're a submitted and sanctified member of God's church, you're not going to be able to serve him. And if you're not submitted and sanctified in your membership, you're not going to be able to be a good servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
you're going to struggle in your service, you're going to be unhappy in it, you're going to be unfulfilled in it, and you're going to be that for everybody else. Everybody else is going to feel the pain that you cause, they're going to feel the unfruitfulness that you bring in your service, and you're going to cause problems instead of bringing solutions and causing peace to come into a cer certain situation. Now, this is the way the Lord has it. Hold your place there in Acts chapter 13 and go to uh, 1 Corinthians 12. Here we have the body truths. And he says in verse 18, God hath set the members in the body. But he says in verse 25 or verse 24, for our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked. That there should be no schism or tear in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. There's a good message to preach sometime. No tear, but care. And when one, whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it, or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. So we have a body part membership in Christ's body. The church is Christ's body. The local New Testament church is Christ's body. It's meant to do God's bidding, carry out God's purposes, carry out the work of Christ. Christ is not here in the flesh. He leaves his church and his church is to do his work for him. So this is where we do his work. Uh, we are inhabited by the Holy Ghost. We join together in membership. Now we are all members of one body and we have the opportunity to act as a body together. What happens when one of us is doing wrong and wants to go the opposite direction? What if my right hand all of a sudden decided it wanted to be my left hand? Would, it work, would things work very well? What if my eye decided it wanted to be my nose? Things wouldn't work very well. So we have to be in our proper place, wherever God would have us, and doing our best. And you know how it is sometimes in your life when you have an ache or a pain in one part of your body, and it makes another part of your body hurt. Sometimes people who have a, they have got a knee problem or they've got a hip problem, and now all of a sudden they have a back problem. Well, where did that come from? Well, because you're favoring a certain thing over here, and so you're not walking structurally correct. And so now that's causing difficulty in your body. It's the same way in God's church. When we have one issue somewhere, it causes an issue somewhere else. And now you have two issues instead of one issue to deal with. And we need to get all the issues resolved so that we can serve the Lord together. We need to be members of Christ's church, and we need to be submitted and sanctified members of Christ's church in order to serve him correctly. Acts chapter 11, you look at uh, verse 25, you find in this place Barnabas departed to Tarsus for to seek Saul. When he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. For an entire year, they were a member of these church. Notice that it says they assembled themselves with the church. They came together with the assembly. They were members of this church. Paul and Barnabas were there serving. Do you think God wanted to use Paul and Barnabas? Absolutely. God did use Paul and Barnabas. Would God have used Paul and Barnabas if they weren't members of this church? They weren't, wouldn't be submitted to God's plan for their lives? No. He used them because they were being faithful in God's church. They assembled themselves with the church a whole year and taught much people, and the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. You see how because people were acting together as Christ's body, they were rec it was recognized that they were like Christ, and so they were called Christians. So the whole swath of believing people was called Christians because of the actions of church members. In Acts chapter 11, verse 25 and 20, verses 25 and 26, membership in Christ's church is the way to minister to the Lord. How do we minister to the Lord or serve the Lord? We have to be members of Christ's church. And of the church of Antioch, they were members, they received a mission from this church. And then in Acts chapter 14, they reported to this church in verse 26. They fulfilled their, this second ministry that they had. They had ordained them elders in every church, prayed with fasting, and commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. In verse 26, they sailed thence to Antioch, from whence they had been recommended to the grace of God for the work which they fulfilled. They went back to the place that had sent them, and they gave a report of what they had done, what they were commissioned to do. They were submitted members of that church. They were accountable and responsible to that church. And so they went back and gave the report, even though Paul was an apostle. And actually, probably because Paul was an apostle, he demonstrated that. When they were come and had gathered the church together, they rehearsed all that God had done with them and how he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles and there abode long time with the disciples. 
uh, we need to have a prolonged membership in Christ's church. Notice verse 2 says in, verse, in chapter 13, as they ministered to the Lord. As they ministered to the Lord. Some people, they, wanna, uh, they, they, they get excited about a certain thing. Well, now, now is the time I need to do that without being patient. And maybe the Lord wants you to be a member of a church for a long time before he, he, he uses you for a certain thing. Maybe he wants you to be a member for a short time before he uses you for a certain thing. You need to be just willing to serve God whenever and wherever. I praise God for those people that whenever you ask them to do a job, whenever they're approached with a need, they're ready to fulfill it. Not because they were champing at, uh, clamping, uh, champing, clamping at the bit trying to get that position or that job done, but because, because they were just willing. They were available. They were ready. And when they were called upon to serve, they were willing to serve. They had a prolonged membership that was just full of faithfulness. And God calls us to ministries in God's church when we're serving him generally. When we're sold out, consistent servants for the Lord, God uses us. And that's what we want to be. It's not about one specific or certain job necessarily, but whatever it is that God wants me to be involved in, I need to be full of a prolonged membership. I guarantee you that Paul and Barnabas were not uh, called to do the Lord's work here during a period of spotty and shoddy service for the Lord. I guarantee it. They weren't missing services, and then God called them and commissioned them to do this work. They weren't doing a half-hearted job or a self-serving job when God called them to do this work. They weren't. They were being faithful members. And notice it says, as they ministered to the Lord, they had a prolonged membership. It says at the end of chapter 12 that they fulfilled their ministry in verse 25. At the end of chapter 13, again, they fulfilled their ministry. They had a prolonged membership, a fulfilled ministry. They were people who were proven in their work. They had a prolonged membership in Christ's church. Some of you have been members of a, a Bible-believing church for 30 or 40, even 50 years. Anybody been a member of a, a Bible-believing church for 50 years? Anybody? Nobody's that old? Nobody wants to admit they're that old? 40 years? Oh, Mrs. Twombly, thank you. There, there we have a, you got a prize, but we don't have any prizes tonight. I'm sorry. But praise God for that. You're just ready and you're just willing. You're just there. And it's easy to leave. You got 100,000 different reasons to leave a church. There'll always be there. There'll always be somebody in the body who's an annoyance to you and is a burr under your saddle. There's always something that somebody does that is a frustration to you. There'll always be something that you wish was done differently. Always. You will never be in a position where that's not true. But these men stayed, and they were there just waiting for whatever the Lord had them to do. It. And in that time, they were faithful, and they were ministering to the Lord. They weren't just there doing nothing. They were there ministering to the Lord. So God uses us for one thing. Sometimes then he uses us for a different thing, which is what he did with them. But sometimes it's the same thing. But are we there constantly ministering to the Lord, a prolonged membership, having a fulfilled ministry? By the way, but over in Colossians 4, you don't have to turn there. But in Colossians 4, Paul had to challenge somebody who was, uh, whether he was not doing it or was just tempted not to do it, I'm not sure. But in Colossians chapter 4, verse 17, he said, Say to Archippus, Take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, that thou fulfill it. So maybe he was fulfilling it, and Paul was just encouraging him to keep on. But he was telling him, you need to take heed to that ministry and fulfill it. In a prolonged manner, you need to be consistent in that and fulfill the ministry that you have. A lot of people will make promises, empty promises. I'll do this. I'd love to do this. I want to serve the Lord in this way. But when it comes down to it, and a little bit of difficulty is there, well, now they're not there. Okay, well then... You're probably not going to be able to be used by the Lord. You're not really ministering to the Lord. You're just seeing how everybody else can minister to you. And I can go through the church and I can name, while well, this person's doing everything. This person's doing everything. And then I can name some others. Maybe they're not doing very much at all. I say, well, maybe he's talking about me. I, I, I'm, as God is my witness, I'm not really thinking of anybody, any specific people. But if I, if I took the membership list, I could say, what are they doing? And I could say, wow, look at, look at all they're doing. There's statistics out there that 20% uh, of the people in a church do 80% of the work. And that's usually true. Well, what kind are you? What kind are you? A prolonged membership. They had a purposeful membership. They ministered to the Lord. So they had a direction for what they were doing. They didn't just come to church because it was the right thing to do. They came to the church because they wanted to obey the Lord. They wanted to minister and serve the Lord. They had a great love for him. They ministered to the Lord. Look over at chapter 11 again, verse 23. Uh, who, when he came, this is Barnabas, when he came and had seen the grace of God and was glad and exhorted them all that with 
purpose of heart, they would cleave unto the Lord. Do you have purpose of heart in your church membership? Or is it just, well, I know I have to do this, so I'm going to do that thing. No, that's, that's the start of it. But what's about beyond that? Do you have a purpose heart to serve the Lord? A purpose heart. He says that with purpose of heart, they would cleave unto the Lord. To cleave isn't the idea of, well, yeah, I'll be there. It's to grab hold and not let go. You would cleave unto the Lord with purpose of heart. They had a purposeful membership. We need to have a purpose for what we're doing. Not just doing to do, but recognize the direction of your service. And then also a passionate membership. A passionate membership is a dedicated membership to the point of great affection and even uh, uh, putting yourself out there for sacrifice, if possible, in order to see God's work accomplished. Look at chapter 13. As they ministered to the Lord, verse 2, and fasted, the Holy Ghost said unto, the Holy Ghost said, separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work one to have I have called them. And when they, this is the church members, had fasted and prayed, they laid their hands on them and sent them away. They fasted and prayed. They were seeking the Lord. Lord, what is it that you want us to do? What work do you want us to accomplish? What work do you want us to commission somebody to do? What work do you want us to accomplish individually as members of Christ's body? They fasted and prayed over that. When's the last time you fasted over what ministries you should be involved in in God's church? Anybody? In the last year, have you fasted and said, don't answer, don't raise your hand, okay. I get that, 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 that takes away the purpose of fasting, right? Uh, but raise your hand, don't raise your hand, whatever. Uh, we don't fast over that. We fast over maybe a, a, great, a great time of turmoil, sure. Or maybe you fast because you just forgot to eat. That's what I do sometimes. But that's not, that's not what we're talking about here. When's the last time I fasted? What does God want me to do? Lord, am I serving you in the way, acceptably in the way that you want me to? Maybe you are. Praise God for that. But this is, they had a, a passionate membership, a dedication to that. If we want the Holy, the Holy Ghost to work in our midst, then we need to be in communication with the Holy Ghost. A passionate membership, but they also had a productive membership. Again, notice verse 2, as they ministered to the Lord. The word for minister there is not the normal diakonos, which is a generic serve. It means through the dust, and it's a, it's a idea of just menial service. But the idea here is of a civic service. Um, of, of a, a ministry to a mass group, a service of a mass group. What do we have in a church? We have a mass group. And so he's bringing out this aspect of our services here that when we are ministering, we're ministering to the Lord's church by ministering to the Lord. So we're ministering to all. What can I do, Lord, that is a ministry to all in God's church? What can I do that's a ministry to other people? Well, there's a million and seven things that you can do. We had it in the bulletin this morning. Speak to Brother Claude. There's a ministry that you can do. You say, well, I'm not doing that. I can do that. Okay. Well, I, I could help here. I can help here. I can pray more here. I can give out a gospel tract here. I can witness over here. I, these are things I can do. I can give an encouraging word over here. This is what I can do. I can minister to the Lord, minister to his church. They had a productive membership. Romans 12, all about the spiritual gifts, tells us about how we're there to serve the Lord. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. Lord, just use me. Here I am. I have this body that is the temple of the Holy Ghost. I have it to use for you. I have my voice to use. I have my heart to use. I have my hands to use. What do you want me to do for you? These things are yours. This is your body. And I want to use it in Christ's body to edify the church, to build it up. We need to be serving out of a sense of duty and out of a sense of honor in the Lord, a productive membership. This is what these men had. They had a, pro, a prolonged membership. They had a purposeful membership. They had a passionate membership, and they had a productive membership. And this is the way we need to be tonight. We should have an attitude of production for the Lord, being fruitful. I love that word fruitful because when we're fruitful, that means that things are healthy. That means that things are good. We have to always be guarding that some blight doesn't come in and hurt the tree. We have to be always be guarding that someone's not coming by with the weed whacker and killing these trees like we were doing out here, uh, which Brother Brian helped us out with. See, he served. He benefited everybody by keeping the trees beautiful. Uh, we, we have uh, all, all of these opportunities to be infected or for a storm to come and blow us down. We have to be protected regarding these things in our lives 
all the time. So while things are going great right now, well, maybe next week they won't be. What's going to happen next week? You get through one challenge and Satan is sure to hurl one at you. He's sure to throw some fiery darts. And we better have the shield of faith up and ready to quench those as he brings them to us. We need to be careful as we come to our local church body that we don't have a universal church mindset. In other words, some people think, well, because I'm a Christian, I can do whatever I want. I can go wherever I want. I choose these things. I choose what church I go to. I choose what service I do for the Lord. It's my thing. It's my deal. It's my life. No, it's not. God sets the members in the church. Everyone is, hath pleased him. Where there is no universal body, the body of Christ is the local church. So we don't have this, we should not have this attitude, well, I can leave whenever I want to, and I can come back if I want to. This is not God's way for us to behave. And it makes us unfruitful. Why? Because it makes us have this non-committed attitude. And I don't have the best of the body at heart. I have the best of me at heart. Go back, going back to 1 Corinthians 12, we have all those body parts. Uh, what if my left hand just desires to protect itself? It doesn't want to lift all those heavy things. It doesn't want to uh, shield the eyes because it might get injured. So you know how your natural reflex is when something's coming at your eyes to go like this? That's, you understand that? That's, that's natural, and your left hand is helping out your eyes or your right hand, whatever hand. Well, I don't want to be involved in that. What's going to be injured? My eyes are going to be injured. Which one is an easier one to heal? A cut on my hand or a sliced eyeball? Well, I, I don't want to help the right hand out here, so the right hand has to do all the work or uh, all the difficult things. Well, that causes the body to suffer. Why? Because the left hand has his own interests at heart. And sometimes we can get like that. I have my own interests at heart. I have my own desires. I have my own way of thinking. And everybody else or the... Uh, it isn't as important in my eyes. This is not the way God will have us be. We need to be careful about that. I find that some people, when it comes to churches, they use a church for what they can get out of it. If they have children, they perhaps use the church for music, or they use the church for an opportunity to serve, or they use the church for social endeavors. They use the church because they know that they're supposed to have a worship or worshipful relationship with the Lord. But when it comes to accountability or the hard things, well, man, I have, a, I have things I need to do. Uh, I don't want to be involved in that. I'm going to bail on this situation. Oh, we have this coming up. This is more important than that. This is, uh, these are attitudes that we should not have, and I guarantee you Paul and Barnabas did not have these attitudes, and neither did the members of this church at that time. They fasted and prayed over serving the Lord. Fasted and prayed over serving the Lord. So we need to be careful uh, regarding our attitude in Christ church. We need to have productive membership in Christ church. You ever heard that song, A Back Pew Baptist? I have a, a friend, his name is Dwight Smith, from way back. He's an evangelist, and uh, he, he's a good man. But anyway, he sings this song. I don't know if he wrote it or if somebody else wrote it. I don't have the author's name, so if somebody wrote it, I'm sorry. I'm stealing their thing. But it goes like this. I'm a back pew Baptist, don't you know? To the front, I just won't go. Because people might expect me to do all the things I ought to do. Down in front, I might get stirred by the things that I've heard. And that's not good for me, you see. The back row pew is best for me. Okay, Grant, you're back there. Brother Tony, you're back there. Andy, yeah, okay. No, no, no. You get the point. Way back here, I'll sit and rest where I don't have to do my best. My life may not be in accord because I'm a back pew Baptist for my Lord. The preacher's singing way up there. I can't hear, but I don't care. There's more important things to do with others in this back row pew. When the preacher does his stuff, very soon I've had enough. And then I sit back and meditate on things that I appreciate. Now someday at the front I'll be, there for everyone to see. That is, when at last I've come to die, and in the casket I will lie. Then to heaven I'll surely go, for I'm saved by grace, you know. And when I get there, I shall see a back row pew in heaven for me. This is the way it'll be. If we don't have a, a front row seat in the service of the Lord now, we're going to lose the reward of the Lord later. This is a way that we can be challenged to serve the Lord. Also, not only were they members in God's church, but they received a mission from God. And each one of us has a mission from God to do what God has for us in his church. Verse 2, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. So 
God has a work for you to do. Maybe it's a work like Paul and Barnabas, or maybe it's a work that nobody ever knows about. But it's still a work for God, and God has it for you. It's God's work for you. It's, it's first of all, a, I'll call it this, a parochial and providential mission. Parochial having to do with the church. Okay, and providential, in other words, having to do with God, mission. They both start with P, okay? I have to use those words. But they help us understand. They were there with the church. Look at what happened. In verse 2, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work one do I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost. All right, go to chapter 14, verse 26. From thence they sailed to Antioch, from, thence, from whence they had been recommended to the grace of God for the work which they fulfilled. When they came, were come together and gathered the church together, they rehearsed all that God had done with them and how he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. So in verse 26, who did the work? The answer is Paul and Barnabas. They fulfilled the work. In verse 27, who did the work? God did the work. Do you see that? God did the work, and Paul and Barnabas did the work. Paul and Barnabas did God's work. They did God's will, and God empowered them to do it. Perhaps when they thought they didn't. But that goes back to something that's special. Go back to Acts chapter 13, and we'll read verses 2 and 3 again, and the beginning of verse 4. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. So who said separate me? And who called these men? The Lord did. The Holy Ghost did. Verse 3, And when they had fasted and prayed, they laid their hands on them, and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. Who sent them? The church sent them. So did the Holy Ghost send them? Because verse 4 says, So they being sent forth by the Holy Ghost. Did the Holy Ghost, did the Lord send them, or did the church send them? Yes. Brother, Brother Jim got it. Yes. Just like the work was done by the men and by the Lord, so the church sent them, and so the Holy Ghost sent them. Do you see, when the Lord gives us work to do, and we do it for Him in His way and by His strength, we're doing His work. And it doesn't matter what work it is. We don't hear what the church members continue to do after Paul and Barnabas left, but could Paul and Barnabas have gone and done that work without the church there behind them serving the Lord? Would the Holy Ghost have been able to say, separate me, Barnabas and Saul, if they hadn't been fasting and praying regarding their service for the Lord? See how the Lord directs his church? How will I know what God wants me to do? Well, we might have an aspiration to do a certain thing. God may put it on our heart. I would like to do that. Now, not everything that God puts on your heart that you would like to do is the thing that God wants you to do. Okay? There's a lot of things I would like to do. I would like to, uh, to uh, plant 50 churches in my life. Man, wouldn't that be great? God probably doesn't have that for me to do, personally. There are some things that I would like to do that maybe it's not best for me to get involved in. But often, so not always, but often, God gives us a desire to do something. Maybe it's just a desire to do something. I want to do something for the Lord. Maybe it's a desire to do a specific thing. I want to do a specific thing for the Lord. And that might begin the Lord's directing in your life. In 1 Corinthians 12, he says, Covet earnestly the best gifts or the opportunities to serve the Lord in those ways. And he says, covet earnestly. In other words, have a desire to do that. Have a desire for these productive things. First Timothy 3, regarding the office of, of a bishop, he said, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desires a good work. So we have a lot of good, we can have a good desire in our lives, and maybe that's an indication of God's desire for you to do a certain work in his church. So this isn't to say, if you want it, you got it, but it says, that's good. It's a good thing to have a desire to serve the Lord. I know uh, some, some who say, well, God told me to do this. Well, did he? I don't know. You say that, but that kind of goes against his word here, so I don't think that that's right. Or we didn't ask you to do that, or you're out of line in doing that, so just because you aspire to do it doesn't mean it's good. But often, God lays on our heart to do something for somebody. Often, God lays on our heart, I want to get involved in certain part of ministry here. Is that, could that be from the Lord? It sure could. The Lord could be laying that on your heart. But also, how about recognition? In Acts chapter 18, it was Priscilla and Aquila who recognized the man Apollos. You don't have to turn there. He, they recognized 
the ability and the use, uh, God's use of Apollos. And so they nurtured him and brought him along to the point where he could help others. See that, how they recognized that in his life? Paul and Barnabas recognized John Mark, Silas, Timothy, and Titus, among many others. They were all recognized by leaders in God's church who said, hey, maybe God wants you to do this. And that was a confirmation of God's working in their lives to do whatever it was, to do whatever it was. Not only aspiration, recognition, but lastly, authorization. Paul told Titus, you ordain elders. He laid hands on Timothy. Paul said, these things I've committed unto the son Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 1. And so there's going to be an authorization for you to do that. You're going to receive an instruction. Okay, this is something you ought to do. This is something you ought not to do. This is something you ought to do, but you ought to do it this way instead. We have an authorization from the Lord to serve him. These are things that God brings. He brings sometimes a desire, an aspiration. He brings a recognition. Somebody says, yes, you, you could be good at that. Um, uh, no one's going to ask. Uh, I'm trying to think, sing of something. Well, here, here's a good for instance. Brother Chad teaches music in the, in the school. It's kind of natural for us to assume, hey, maybe he would be involved in music in God's church, right? We would recognize that skill and that ability in his life. Brother David plays the piano. I might recognize, hey, maybe you ought to play the piano for the choir, you know? You have that skill. Or Terry, you know, who, just, there's just there's one aspect of ministry, one aspect of things that we do in our church. Some people are good at cooking. Well, maybe you should be involved in this part of it. Some people are, are real involved in details. Hey, help us schedule this thing or, or plan this out. Hey, uh, what, you know, whatever it is, we have different aptitudes, and those things are recognized, but then also authorized. Just because you're good at something doesn't mean you should be the one to do it. Uh, I like to think that I'm good at everything. That doesn't mean I should do everything. Sometimes I have to let somebody else do something, and they do it better than me. Or maybe they don't do it as good as me, but I still, it wasn't my place to do it. And the same goes for you. Sometimes just let somebody else do it. Let them fulfill that ministry. Let them do it in their way. You don't have to change the way they're doing it. They're doing fine. Uh, this was difficult for me. I, I, you probably, if you went back and talked to the people at, at a community where I came from, uh, they, I, I don't know what their perspective is. I can just tell you from my perspective of, my, of myself from years ago, the first, uh, I, this might have been 20, 2010, maybe 2011, right, in, right around there, we did a big drama and I directed the drama. Well, I was so stressed out and all the details that had to go into it. And, and uh, it, was a big, it was a big production. A lot of people, a lot of lights and sound and cues and all of these things, just a lot of things going on. And I was so stressed out about it and I wanted everything to go perfect. Guess what? It didn't go perfect. And, but everything, I, was, I would get myself overly frustrated because so-and-so didn't do their thing at the right time. And I, over time, not because I was spiritual, but because I had to do it a number of times, I started to realize what things were important and what things, no. You're not the one to do everything, and sometimes they can do it better. Let them do it their way. Uh, sometimes uh, that's not possible, but when we can, let's recognize, let someone else do it, but am I the one who's been asked to do it? Am I the one that's been separated out to do it? Now I'm authorized. I ought to be doing that. And I ought to be like Archippus, who Paul said, tell him to take heed to his ministry that he fulfills it and does a good job with it. This is what we need to be. All right, this is how, uh, perhaps how we know it was a parochial and providential mission, but it was also a partitioned mission. Notice the Lord said in Acts chapter 13, separate me, Barnabas and Saul, uh, Barnabas and Paul, for the work which I have called them. Uh, Barnabas and Saul, yeah, not Paul. Barnabas and Saul, for the work wherein do I have called them. So they weren't separated out of the church, but they were separated to do that thing. Okay, they had a specific mission. Sometimes that's the way it is. Hey, I would like you to do this. You and you and you, you need to do this. Or there's a need that needs to be met, and these three people over here band together to do this thing that the Lord has laid on their heart. They're separated to do these things. Notice, look at uh, verse 2. Here you have a bunch of men. There were prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simeon, that was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, which had brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. So you have these guys here. You have five, five names list, listed. You have Paul, you have Barnabas, you have Menaean, you have Lucius, and you have Simeon. Which five of those were better 
If you could pick two of those five, which two would you pick? Well, that's not what the Lord did. It wasn't that one of them is better than the other ones. God said, they're all here fasting and praying, but I have a job for two of them to do. We can't all do the same job. God has a different job for some of us to do. And so he sent Paul and he sent Saul and Barnabas to do that work. Praise God for that. These others stayed back and they, did God, they carried God's work there. Whatever God's work is for you, do God's work. And he'll take care of the rest. It was a partition mission, but it was also a particular mission. Paul always went to the synagogue first, seems like. Paul went to the synagogue first because he looked like a Jew. He talked like a Jew. He acted like a Jew. And he thought like a Jew. And he knew all the things that Jews know. And he had a great love for the, Jew, for the Jews because they were his people. So even though Paul was the apostle to the Gentile, often he went to the synagogues first when he came to a city. Why did he do that? He had an aptitude to do that. That was also the place where uh, God-fearing people would meet. But he had an aptitude in those things. You have aptitudes that God has given you. You've, you have certain experiences that God has given you. You have certain knowledge and ability that God has given you that he hasn't given to somebody else. You have certain connections with people that I don't have and that nobody else in this church has. God's given you those things. Use them for the Lord. Allow the Lord to use that in your life. It was a particular mission. There is somebody that you can minister to, and there's a way that you can minister that nobody else can because of the way God has worked in your life. But it was also a protested mission, and this is what we need to know tonight. It was a protested mission, and every time we decide, I'm going to serve the Lord, it's going to be protested. You're going to find opposition to serving the Lord. Notice what happened. There's going to be blessings, and there's going to be struggles. Blessings and struggles, blessings and struggles all the way wrong, uh, along. Look at chapter 13. Here they went out. What happens right away? Verse 8, Elimus the sorcerer, for so his name is, by is his name by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. So you have this man who's, they're trying to lead him to the Lord. In verse 7, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man who called Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. And Elimus the sorcerer is over there trying to cast doubt on what Paul and, uh, Saul, and Silas are, uh, Saul and Barnabas are saying. He's trying to cast doubt on it. He's trying to turn him away from the Lord. They're facing opposition. But they also, faced, they also saw blessing. Look at verse 12. Then the deputy, Sergius Paulus, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine, the teaching of the Lord. So you have a struggle, you have opposition, but you have blessing when you serve the Lord. And they could have thrown up their hands when they faced that opposition and said, you know what, we'll come back another time. This, is not, this, isn't, uh, this isn't working. We got this opposition here. We can't, nobody can hear what's going on. This guy's casting doubt on everything. No, we're going to serve the Lord. And God brought a a, uh, a sign there by making him blind. Immediately on Elimus there fell on him a mist and a darkness. And he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. Well, that'd be nice if I could do that to the naysayers. You're going to have to be blind for a while, you know. Uh, but we're going to have trouble, but we're going to have blessing. Look at verse 13. Now Paul and his company loosed from Paphos. They came to Perga and Pamphylia and John. John Mark departing from them returned to Jerusalem. Oh, boy. Is this going to happen in our church life? Are some going to depart from us and go back to another place? They don't want to serve the Lord in this way? Yeah, that's going to happen. John, John Mark left them. We're going to see that. That's discouraging when that happens. It causes, it causes uh, unsettledness in our lives when that happens. And it, it's sad when that happens. The relationships that we have change. It's a sad thing. Praise God for John Mark. He got brought back again. But it's a sad thing. They face opposition. When you try to serve the Lord, you're going to face opposition. Later on, Paul was able to say, Bring John Mark, for he's profitable for me for the ministry. Many at Antioch of Pisidia were saved in verses, two and 40, verses 42 and 43, and also verse 48. But then they had persecution from the Jews. Look at verse 44. The next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy. And spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. They had persecution that was brought into their lives and into their ministry. 
But many of these were saved, verse 48. Many of these were saved. The disciples were full of joy, but look at verse 50. But the Jews stirred up the devout and honorable women and the chief men of the city and raised persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them out of their coasts. They drove them out. Think that was discouraging? Well, we thought God was working here. We saw people be saved. We can't even stay and help these people grow. We're kicked out. They expelled them out of their co- out of their co- out of their coasts. Now they went to Iconium, and this is what happened. They shook off the dust of their feet against them and came into Iconium. But at Iconium, they had trouble also. Uh, in Lystra, look at chapter fourteen, verse twenty. This is where I'm, that's where I mean to be. And these uh, persecutors, these people of opposition, were chasing them around. Verse 19, there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium who pers- persuaded the people, and having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. Well, that's discouraging. I had never been stoned. Hope I won't, I hope I won't ever be. But... These people chased him. They wouldn't even leave him alone. He's just trying to do the Lord's work, and they're chasing him from place to place, from city to city. Howbeit, as the disciples stood round about him, he rose up and came into the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derby. They left for Derby. They had a protested mission. If you're going to serve the Lord, you're going to have a protested mission. I don't care how menial or small your service is for God, you're going to face opposition. Uh, Satan doesn't like it when we serve the Lord, when we minister to the Lord. Our flesh doesn't like ministering to the Lord. Uh, A lot of other people, perhaps, don't like it when we minister to the Lord. We're going to have a protest submission. But if we serve the Lord in the right way, we're going to have a prosperous mission. We're going to have a prosperous mission. Look at the end of chapter 14, verse 21. When they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch. See how they're going back to these places? And what were they able to do? They were able there to confirm the souls of the disciples and exhort them to continue in the faith and that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. See, they didn't have rose-tinted glasses when it came to their service for the Lord. They said, we're going to have much tribulation, but stick with it, stay with the Lord. And they were able to confirm the souls of the disciples. That's fruitfulness. That's productive ministry. Verse 25, they ended up preaching in Perga. They went down to Italia and thence to Antioch. That's their sending church from whence they had been recommended the grace of God for the work which they fulfilled. They had a prosperous mission. They fulfilled the work. They finished the work that God had for them. Then God gave them something else to do. They finished that work that God gave them to do. When they were come and had gathered the church together, they rehearsed all that God had done with them and how he had opened the door of faith unto the Gentiles. You know what you can do after you live a life of faithfulness even five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, and it just gets better after that. Faithfulness to the Lord, you'll have a lot of trials, a lot of opposition in your life, but you know what you can now start saying? You can start to now rehearse. Rehearse what God did in your life. I was here, and this happened, but we were faithful to the Lord, and so he blessed us in this way. The Lord allowed us to do this over here. Look what was accomplished here. And yeah, we had this struggle, but look what God did here. Look at all the grace of God, how he worked in our lives. They rehearsed all that God had done with them. And that's the ultimate thing. When they got back, they weren't saying all the great things that they had done. They were saying, look what God did. God did this and this and this and this. Because their service was fruitful for the Lord. They had a prosperous mission. What is your mission going to be? I praise God for the people of our church who are servants of Christ. And they are willing, at the drop of a hat, to serve the Lord, to do whatever needs to be done. Sometimes nobody ever knows about it. They just do it. I praise God for that. And sometimes we're, somebody is specifically asked to do something and people are willing to do it. God's people want to do it. Praise God for that. Is there something lacking in my life? I need to change the way I think about something. Well, then may the Lord work that in your heart. But if you're serving the Lord, I pray that God encourages you with these thoughts. This is God's work. You're doing God's work. You're doing it for him. You're doing it in his strength. The Holy Spirit of God has led you to do it. You've been asked to do it or you've been uh, uh, authorized to do it. You're serving the Lord. Stick with it, even if it's difficult. One day you'll be able to rehearse all that God has done in your life. Let's pray. Father, again, we thank you for allowing us to look into your words tonight. I thank you for these men, uh, these five that we have record of, but the whole church that was there that fasted and prayed over their service for you. I pray that you'd help us to have that heart, 
that we're just willing to serve you and willing to minister to the Lord. Help us to have that attitude for you, that our lives are not for ourselves or for our own enjoyment, but that we are ministering to you. To you. So, Lord, we thank you for your word, and we thank you for the testimony of these men. We pray that you'd help it to impact our hearts tonight. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.